a warning. This podcast includes violence, graphic details, and conversations about serious mental illness. And if you haven't listened to Locked Inside Episode 1, Murder at Tilda Manor, we recommend you start there first. Did you get blood all over yourself in the clothes? Yeah. Okay. Have you washed those clothes since this all happened? Yeah. This is a reenactment of a suspect talking with detectives. Okay, so are they in the washer or are they out of the washer? They're uh, in the bathroom. They're in the bathroom. Are they wet or dry or do you know? They're wet. They were soaked. Soaked with blood or with water? Water. The suspect is in a room, sitting with handcuffs, describing this bloody wash. Okay, so you soaked him in what? The tub or the sink or...? Bathroom, uh, the shower. Okay, um, did you take a shower too? Get the blood off you and all that stuff? Yes, I did. Okay, but you left those clothes in the bathroom. Yeah. The suspect is Christopher Lambeth, the same Christopher Lambeth we reported on in episode one arrested for killing another resident with his bare hands at that group home in Gilbert, Arizona. Except in this interview, he's not talking about that crime. Okay. Where did you leave the knife again? On the bathroom counter. On the bathroom counter? Did you wash that off too? Exactly 16 years before he was arrested for that group home murder, Lambeth was in custody at the Sheriff's Department in Pima County, right in Tucson. I'm Detective Hogan, and that's Detective George. We'd like to talk to you, if you're cool with that, but we're going to try to make you comfortable first. We're looking for some socks. Are your feet okay? My feet are fine. They start by asking his age and name. You said you're 20. Yeah. I guess we could write down your name and everything while we're sitting here. Is it Chris or Christopher, like, legally your whole name? It's Christopher William Lambeth. With C-H? or K. C-H. Then the detectives brace themselves for what's about to be a chilling confession. How do you know they're dead? I killed them. You killed them? Yeah. This is episode two of Locked Inside, Guilty Except Insane, a story of a troubled young man's deadly outburst. You can tell me, man, you know, are you glad they're gone? Yeah and how your home might not always be your safe space. You know, seeing that, it was just horrific because these people were completely defenseless. And a dark reminder that history can repeat itself. But they believed that God would protect them. I'm Erica Stapleton, and to start, I'll take you to a small community outside of Tucson where Christopher Lambeth once reluctantly called home and where his family's lives would change forever. I care about the underdog. I care about the little guy. I care about the people who are ignored by the rest of society. This is Cheryl Kornman, a former reporter with the Tucson Citizen. She covered the area for several years and came to know not only the city pretty well, but the communities that surround it. And a lot of Cheryl's stories focused on social justice issues. And I found uh, during my career that a lot of other reporters didn't want to do that kind of reporting because it's very upsetting, you know, interacting with the people that you meet who need these services. They would refuse to go to a homeless camp. They actually would refuse to cover these stories. And I said, you know, I'll go. So um, it's been a passion of mine. And, um, and that's what I was doing in the last years when I was at the Tucson One of her biggest stories that still haunts her to this day comes from a tiny community called Rejito, about a 20-minute drive north of downtown Tucson. Rejito is just like an area. It's not incorporated, uh, which means it doesn't have its own government. So it's in Pima County because it's outside of any particular city limits. It's just a few minutes off the interstate. That area and the land uh, north of it uh, was used for cotton farming a long time ago. And so it's a farm, you know, kind of a farming area. There aren't aren't a lot of active farms in the Rito area, but it's remote. And it's usually pretty quiet. But back on April 10th, 2005, something unsettling stood out. 
It was a Sunday morning, and people in Rojito were getting ready for church, like they always did. There are a lot of churches, you know, not just in Rojito, but in that area, and they tend to be fundamentalist Christian. But when services started that morning, people noticed that two community fixtures weren't there. Longtime couple Carl and Patricia Gremler, grandparents, both in their 70s, well-known in tight-knit Rojito. Well, they were very um, active in the community. They took part with a group that was protesting um, unhealthful emissions from a cement factory, which was along the interstate there. And uh, they were very vocal, you know, I I guess you'd call them activists, but they were, you know, gray-haired activists who really cared about their community. Friends of theirs told me that for a long time they volunteered at a food bank. And so there was a food bank just a few miles from where they lived, and they regularly volunteered there. So they were very socially conscious, very kind, you know, wouldn't hurt a fly, cliche, but really wouldn't hurt a fly kind of people. And their absence at church that Sunday morning wasn't just noticeable, it was out of the norm. The couple's friend, Nelson Bell, hadn't heard from the Gremlers for a few days. And after missing them at church that Sunday, he decided to head over to their house and see what was up. My understanding is you're the one who reported this incident today? Uh, yeah, yes it was. Well, uh, I came here and everything was so suspicious looking that I, uh, I called my uh, wife and she called the sheriff's department. To be very transparent, this is a reenactment of Nelson Bell's conversation with an investigator, just like the reenacted interview at the beginning of this episode. The Pima County Sheriff's Department who investigated this case originally recorded these interviews back in 2005. But in January 2020, the department said it destroyed the recordings in this case as part of a routine cleanout. And if you're wondering how they were destroyed, the tapes were burned, incinerated. No chance we can ever bring them back. For 15 years, the sheriff's department never made any duplicates, and they never made any digital copies. So unfortunately, we can't share that evidence with you in its original form. But we do have the transcript, so we know exactly what was said. And those interviews are important to this story, so we're recreating them from those transcripts to help you understand what happened. Let's pick back up with the couple's friend, Nelson Bell. On the way over, I had a real gut feeling because they didn't uh, they didn't show up for sh- church on Sunday, and I tried to call them yesterday from uh, from noon till eight last night, and all I got was a busy signal. So I came over this morning, uh, and I was going to call Carl, that that was his name, and tell them I was coming over today, and I couldn't get an answer this morning. Uh, the phone was still busy. Nelson told the investigator he knew the couple for about a decade. He'd been to their home before, right along I-10, the main highway that connects Tucson to Phoenix. The Gremlers had their own house, a rental home, a garage, and a red brick business building, all on the same plot of land. Carl Gremler, a car enthusiast, ran an auto shop of sorts from that garage. Nelson would sometimes come by and work on cars with Carl. It wasn't like the Gremlers not to answer the phone. I was very suspicious, you know. I had been for a long time, but I drove up to the gate and there was a broken window on one of the buildings in the front. And I uh, I drove through the gate and there was another broken window on the side towards the house. And uh, there was hair stuck to it, you know. This was Tuesday, April 12, 2005. Two days after the Gremlers didn't show up for church, Nelson's gut feeling turned out to be right. Something was clearly wrong. So he called his wife, who told him she'd call for help. I waited probably three quarters of an hour for anybody to show up, but I would, but I stayed out of the sight, out of mind in the meantime, and just kind of watched the place. But nobody could see me, you know? Did you go inside any of the buildings? No. Okay. I wouldn't go in there. Two deputies started by searching the red brick business building. The whole place had been ransacked. Blinds ripped, windows busted out, part of a computer thrown to the floor. One deputy even wrote that the person who did this must have been very angry. The deputies moved to the garage, filled with antique cars Carl had been working on. They didn't see anything out of sorts and made their way to the house. As they approached the sliding glass door at the back of the Gremlers' home, 
one deputy took out a pen and gingerly used it to pull the door open in case there were any fingerprints or any evidence on the handle. The moment they stepped inside, they knew something was very wrong. Everything was dark. The front room was trashed. The widescreen TV was shattered in its case. The couple's two dogs were inside. It seemed like they hadn't been out in a few days based on the mess they left on the floor. The deputies pushed forward through the destruction, their guns drawn, not knowing what or who they might find in the other rooms. As they went down the hallway, one deputy saw a knife sitting on a bathroom sink next to a throwing star. They kept moving toward the bedroom. The TV was on, and as they stepped into the room, they realized someone was lying in bed under the covers. The deputies didn't know it at the time, but this person was Christopher Lambeth. The deputies told him to get out of bed and lie down on his stomach in the hallway. They put him in handcuffs, and later, Lambeth told them that he was the one who trashed the house. I trashed their bedroom looking for money. Okay, why were you looking for money? In case I needed some food or something. You got a drug problem or something like that? No, I don't. The scene got worse. Just imagine, you know, deputies opening the doors and going into that bedroom. After the deputies put Lambeth in handcuffs, Lambeth admitted he killed the people who lived in the home and directed the deputies to the other bedroom across the hall. They braced themselves for what was behind the door. One deputy wrote that the room was in extreme disarray and they could hardly step inside. They said they were so, you know, they had uh, blankets or quilts or something over them, but all they could see was just a giant bloody mess. The first body they saw was Patricia's, slumped on the bed against some pillows. They found Carl's body on the floor. Investigators determined they'd been dead for a few days. And they were stabbed so many times, they never released a, a count but they were so brutalized that they had to have a closed casket for the funeral. Cheryl remembers interviewing deputies who were at the crime scene. And the sheriff's department, the deputies were really upset about it because, you know, seeing that, it was just horrific because these people were completely defenseless. Cheryl also remembers covering a vigil for the couple where she met many of the Gremler's friends. We tried to connect with those who knew them too including that friend Nelson Bell, who sounded the alarm. But after all this time, we learned many of these people passed away. All their friends said that they were just wonderful, gracious, kind people. And, uh, you know, it was a real loss to the friends and to the community when they died. They weren't, you know, people of their age in their late 70s playing golf. And, you know, uh, they were very engaged in their community. Those who knew the Gremlers the best were devastated but not totally shocked. It just, it gives me chills again at the brutality, you know, of the murder, uh, feeling like, I, I feel now like I felt then, this didn't have to happen. These were vulnerable by any definition, vulnerable older people who never should have been put in that position. Christopher Lambeth wasn't an intruder in their house. Christopher Lambeth was Carl and Patricia Gremler's grandson. Are they alive or dead right now? They're dead. Okay, how do you know they're dead? I killed them. You killed them? Yeah. After the deputies found the Gremlers brutally stabbed to death in their own home, they wrapped Lambeth in a blanket and walked him out to a squad car. The dogs in the house started to follow them as they walked outside, and one deputy wrote that Lambeth simply said, please close the gate, the dogs will get out. You don't seem to care too much that they're dead. Was it that bad around the house, or do you care? No, I just, uh... You can tell me, man, you know. Are you glad they're gone? Yeah. I'm happy they're, that they're dead now. Why is that? It really is a lot of personal problems, and I'm just glad it's over with them. They took him to the sheriff's department and started recording an interview with him. Again. The sheriff's department destroyed those tapes, so we're going off of the transcripts. In them, Lambeth repeatedly admitted that he killed his grandparents, and he repeatedly said he didn't want to talk about why. Okay, I, I mean, was there some kind of argument between you guys? How did this, how did this turn into them being dead? Personal problems. I don't want to talk about it. Personal problems you have or between you and them? 
Between us. Between you and your grandparents? Yes. Does it go back a long way or something? Yeah. Like family history? Yeah. Lambeth's history is complicated, but we've been able to trace some of it back through court records. His dad died when he was young. Lambeth and his sister lived with their aunt and uncle for a while before moving back in with their mom, according to Cheryl's reporting. It seems symptoms started around his teenage years. He was admitted to hospitals or other treatment facilities and court ordered for psychiatric evaluations multiple times. He was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder. So he was diagnosed, you know, now it's called schizoaffective disorder, which came on around the time that it typically does in, you know, in the teen years. And uh, they said he was talking to himself and things like this, but he also um, was diagnosed as bipolar. So he was on multiple medications that still weren't controlling his behaviors, um, but he was covered as a what they call public pay individual because he was uh, deemed disabled. So under the disability laws, he could get this public assistance for mental health care. Lambeth told detectives he'd been staying in mental health facilities in a group home before he started staying with his grandparents during the week. This was an arrangement planned by his mom. You said you get this money that comes from Social Security. It goes to your mom, does... What's the arrangements as far as, do they pay your grandparents too? Give them some money for you living there? Yeah, my mom gives my grandparents money. And Lambeth staying with his grandparents wasn't a secret. Neither was his history. Just that he's got some mental issues. I mean, he'll come out in the morning. I've seen him come out in a hooded sweatshirt on and stand there and talk to a tree for half an hour. This is another reenactment with his grandparents' friend, Nelson Bell talking with investigators. He's been hospitalized? Yeah, he's on medication, but uh, if he's not on medication, he goes, he goes kind of off the wall. Have you had conversations with Carl and Pat about Chris? Yeah, uh, I have, yes. What have they said about him? You know, they stick up for their grandson, you know? Uh, I mean, they're not gonna say anything derogative about him. But the Gremlers were worried about their grandson staying in their house. They told Nelson about it. And do you know of any bizarre behavior aside from what you saw about him talking to a tree? Well, he, uh, Carl, was sitting in his car one day here three or four years ago, and he got, uh, Chris got a hold of him and yanked him out of the car and hurt his arm and stuff like that, you know. Despite the threat of danger, Lambeth's grandparents still let him stay there, and Cheryl remembers why. I think it was their religious beliefs. You know, they believed that everybody is a child of God. And, you know, it's, it sounded to me after talking to their friends that in some way they may have felt when the daughter said, will you do, you know, I don't even know if she said, will you do this? I think she may have just said, this is what I'm going to do, that they felt called, you know, by their beliefs to try to take care of this really troubled kid. And they told their friends, we're not going to, they did tell their friends explicitly, who were very worried about them, I'm not going to, we're not going to turn our backs on our grandson, you know, we love him, you know, we know that he's sick, and we're not going to turn our backs on him. And as Cheryl remembers, Lambeth didn't exactly like his accommodations either. A rural area right outside the Tucson city limits where there's nothing, you know, there's the interstate and farmland. And he repeatedly objected to being in that environment and of course didn't like being locked up. The detectives asked Lambeth about this, about living with his grandparents. Here's another reenactment of the destroyed tapes. Were they beating on you? No. Were they keeping you locked in the house all the time? Nope. Were they sexually doing something to you? Nope. Had your grandfather done something like in the past? Nope. Has your grandmother? Nope. Okay, had somebody and then you blame them for it? Uh... Or had something happened to you that they didn't do but you blame them for it? Occasional fights. Okay, between you and them? Yeah. Okay, what was it usually over? Um, freedom. Freedom as in your freedom? Yeah. The detective kept pressing, asking what things were like inside the home and whether those conditions led to Lambeth lashing out. He honed in on that one word, freedom. 
and asked if Lambeth's grandparents ever forced him into anything. He even brought up his stay at a mental health facility. Did they try to keep you from playing video games or something? No, it was just them putting me in all these places and talking a lot of shit to me and uh... When you say put, putting you in places, what do you mean? What do you mean? Octio? That's the name of the mental health facility. Just, just personal confinement. Uh-huh. Like making you go to get that counseling or something like that? Or are you talking about or personal confinement at the house? Um, personal confinement in myself. Okay, so when you're saying that, uh, I'm not going to go to the house and find a cell that you were kept in or something like that, am I? No. Okay, but they basically tried to tell you what you should and shouldn't do and what's right, like everybody's grandparents do. Is that what you're saying? <sighs> not that it was right, but, uh... Um... If you can't explain it, you can't explain it, man. I'm not trying to make you. I can't explain it. Okay. Just personal problems that I've, I've been dealing with them, and... So you didn't see it as them trying to help you? You saw it as them... No, it wasn't helpful at all. It was destructive to me. Christopher Lambeth was charged with two counts of first-degree murder for killing his grandparents. Investigators determined he killed them a few days before their bodies were found, a detail Cheryl still can't shake. You know, think about it. The blood had dried, and there they are. And he's in another room, you know, watching TV like nothing ever happened. And so, yeah, it's just as vivid in my mind, as, you know, now as it was then. It's just horrific. Lambeth told investigators he stopped taking his medicine before killing his grandparents. Do you think you did this because you were off your medication? No. Okay, you think it was just because you wanted to? Like I said, it was just personal problems. Okay. That I didn't want to bring up. Okay, but you don't think you're not being on your medication had anything to do with it? No. Okay. Okay. Not an insane thing to do. It's not because of my medication. After nearly two years of court proceedings, Lambeth pleaded guilty except insane to both counts of murder in 2007. Under Arizona law, guilty except insane, or GEI, means a person has a mental disease or defect of such severity that the person did not know the criminal act was wrong. Here's another reenactment of what Lambeth told the detectives right after his arrest. Did you ever think of calling the police after it all happened? No. No? Why is that? Uh, um... Should I guess? I mean, you didn't want to get in trouble? Uh, right. I didn't call the cops because I didn't want to. I wasn't going to. In the months that followed his arrest for the double murder, Lambeth refused to talk about the alleged crime with his attorney and denied he had any symptoms. Doctors would evaluate him, reporting he had delusions and that he heard voices that weren't there. Court records claimed Lambeth was unable to function in a legal setting, and at one point, he was deemed not competent to stand trial. They agreed to that plea deal because they said, okay, it was a psychotic episode. Not that he's seriously, very seriously mentally ill, should never be on the streets again. They said this was a one-off, you know, he had a psychotic episode. Part of that guilty except insane plea meant Christopher Lambeth wouldn't go to prison. Instead, he was sentenced 25 to life at the Arizona State Hospital for treatment. So we agree, you know, the prosecutors decided to agree because it was pretty obvious that he had a psychotic episode, uh, that it, jail would not be the place for him. You know, they couldn't really, they don't really have the facilities to incarcerate someone who's that ill. After Lambeth went to the state hospital to serve his sentence, his mother and his aunt, Carl and Patricia Gremler's daughters, sued the psychiatrist and two mental health agencies working with Lambeth before the murders in a wrongful death case. They accused the doctor and agencies of not doing enough to help Lambeth before the crime. The doctor settled with Lambeth's family out of court, but the two mental health agencies went to trial. Cheryl remembered testimony that Lambeth's mother was overwhelmed and asked her parents to take him in during the week while she worked. 
But Lambeth's psychiatrist and attorneys for the agencies disagreed, claiming Lambeth's mother didn't sound the alarm until after her parents were killed. And one of the things that the defense attorney pointed out in the wrongful death case is that the mother never complained in any um, uh, in any way on paper about the care of the psychiatrist or about the nonprofit agencies. In the end, a jury split the blame. Christopher Lambeth was deemed to be 25% responsible, the psychiatrist overseeing his care, 25% responsible. And then the two public pay agencies that were involved in his care were each 25% responsible. The out-of-court settlement with the doctor wasn't made public, but in the case that went to trial, Christopher Lambeth's mother and aunt were awarded $1.5 million. We tried to contact Christopher Lambeth's mother, but never heard back. An obituary shows his aunt passed away in 2014. His sister declined to talk with us. As for Christopher Lambeth's 25 to life sentence. I know it sounds dramatic to say this, but they really do have blood on their hands. He'd be back in society long before then, living in the suburbs, working a job. Hypothetically, I can go to a baseball game or have lunch with him or something like that. And the violence he showed when he killed his grandparents would allegedly surface once again in that group home in Gilbert. If he had the, the ability to uh, think about this in a rational way, he would not have killed his grandparents. Next time on Locked Inside. We're heading to Arizona State Hospital to introduce you to the people responsible for Christopher Lambeth's puzzling release and try and figure out why other killers are, to this day, living in the community, not in prison. Do you have faith in the mental health system we have now? No, of course not. At the time of this recording, Christopher Lambeth's current attorney did not respond to any of our requests for comment. Locked Inside is written and edited by me, Erica Stapleton. Executive producer is Katie Wilcox. A special thank you to Kevin Reagan, Judd Slivka, and Eric Watson with our 12 News team for their help in recreating those investigation recordings. Audio mixing is done by Richard Humphreys at Tacoma Media in Silver Spring, Maryland. Fact checking is done by 12 News intern Molly McBride. Locked Inside is produced by the 12 News I-Team and Vault Studios. A special thank you to Will Johnson and Reed Redmond with Vault Studios. If this story resonates with you or you want to share your own experience, you can send an email to connect at 12news.com. We'll catch you next time on Locked Inside.